all stand together. Come on. I believe I'll take a drink from the well. I believe I'll take a drink from the well that given life. Thou only knew the gift of God and who it was that said to thee. Thou would have asked of him, give me drink, and he would give unto thee. I got a inside of me. We apologize, but due to technical issues, we're unable to broadcast the introduction to finding unexpected strength when disappointments leave you shattered. Come on, come on. 
We are looking forward to beginning the series next week. Good evening, everyone. It's TNT. Tonight's guests, Dr. Audrey Chapman and Dr. Kenneth Ballard, join us as we discuss how to stay emotionally and mentally healthy during the coronavirus outbreak. Now here's your host, Dr. Leonard N. Smith. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to this wonderful session of TNT. It's a special session because this is a special time. And what we want to do tonight is to be able to help you to navigate through the challenges that many of you are experiencing during this international crisis that we're involved in today. I'm happy tonight to have with me two distinguished uh, facilitators to help uh, us to grow through this season. And these personalities, I'm sure you already know, but we have uh, Dr. Audrey Chapman. I think everybody knows Dr. Audrey Chapman. She is a noted author and psychologist who has distinguished herself internationally and has been and continues to be uh, sought after for her gifts and skills in this area. We also have uh, Dr. Kenneth Ballard, who we know is uh, the champion and the leader of our Family Life Ministries at the Mount Zion Baptist Church. And uh, he is a licensed therapist and he has uh, certainly been involved perhaps with many of you in your personal lives. Uh, you've seen him on television um, and he's very engaging and involved with helping people to grow through seasons like this. And so I want to welcome the both of you tonight uh, as we share together on this special episode of Thursday Night Teaching. Thank you both for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> well, as we begin tonight, we all know about this coronavirus thing, but I'm not sure we all know how to handle the uncertainties that accompany this virus and this strange time. And so help us tonight to uh, understand how we can navigate the uncertainties. Dr. Chapman, you want to start? You want me to start? Yes. Uh, well, I certainly think that, um, you know, I've had a lot of thoughts over the last uh, couple of weeks, particularly since they have mandated that people do stay home. Um, and one of the things that I think that certainly bombards all of us and leaves us feeling a bit anxious is the uncertainty about all of this. You know, that, yes. that, that we don't know how this is going to all turn out. The yes. other thing that's troubling people, of course, is the confinement. Yes. And the third thing is the economic part. Uh, you know, like, will, will all jobs be there? And uh, what will those changes be about when this, when this ends? But to get down to practical matters, people have been concerned about food, food supply, their children, their education. Uh, a lot of people are now homeschooling, but some children don't have that as a, a benefit. They don't have computers. So we have a lot of multiple issues going on since the pandemic uh, episode of the virus. And I think the first thing always is, uh, that's important is your own mental health. How are you taking care of your mental health? How are you dealing with the anxiety and maybe the depression that set in? Uh, I've been working with people uh, via video conferencing this last couple of weeks, and they've talked about feeling blah and feeling 
empty and feeling cut off from human contact. And I think we, we didn't realize before this how important human contact, personal attachments, relationships with family and friends and how important it is. So I think the first thing is to really not only acknowledge what you're going through, I think that's important, but also to look at what kinds of ways you're going about dealing with the stress of it. Uh, stress brought on by wearing and, and having anxiety. Um, and I don't want to go too far into it. I know you have other questions, but there are many exercises that people can do. And there's diet, there's so many, there's technology, there's so many things that you can begin to consider to help you to cope with the confinement and the anxiety. I guess uh, just before uh, I turn the mic over to uh, Dr. Ken, I guess what you said in a nutshell is what you've been saying for, I guess, 25, 30 years. The question that you always raise, and that question is, how's your relationship with yourself? Absolutely. And so um, I think that you have brought some great points uh, to the forefront. So, Dr. Ken, why don't you uh, yeah, chime in on this? In addition to what Dr. Chapman has, has stated, is you have to look at, when you look at uncertainty, look at your life. Do some reflection. There are probably a whole lot of times in your life when you didn't know how things were going to turn out. I know you're probably saying, no, nothing is like this, maybe not quite like this, but there has been times when you just didn't know when your mama was sick or your daddy was sick or you're pregnant or you're going through a divorce. When you were going through trying times, you just didn't know how it was going to turn out. Uh, you had a choice. You could allow these emotions and these thoughts to totally consume you, or you could just say to yourself, I'm going to rely on faith. Now, mental health and spirituality, they come together. They work together. So if, in these uncertain times, you are, although we're hearing certain things and we're seeing certain things and we're experiencing certain things, we have to rely on our faith. Yes. Our faith is the things of, 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 of what will get you through. So you're uncertain about certain things, but your faith can tell you that things are going to get better. It's not as bleak as it, as it looks. There's a bright side somewhere. And so it, it, when it comes to uncertainty, tap not only to your mental health, because mental health and spirituality, they go together, tap into your faith as well. Great. Um, <clears throat> I think that's, a, that's a, a critical point because sometimes people want to divorce faith from mental health. Yes. When the truth is, um, you can't divorce the two. Um, they, they are permanently married. Yes. And so it's important. Um, even people who don't believe in God mm -hmm. have faith mm -hmm. because faith is so critical to our human existence. Um, you, you think about it. Every time you get on an airplane, mm -hmm. you exercise faith. Mm -hmm. because you don't know whether the person in the cockpit is qualified or not, but you go, you sit in your seat, you buckle up your seatbelt, you do whatever they tell you to do, and you fly on that plane, and you're operating in faith because Absolutely. you believe you're going to make it to your destination. So yeah. you cannot operate in life without a faith, and faith requires good mental health yes um lest you have faith in the wrong thing so uh mm -hmm. we, we want to do that for sure um with this in mind let me ask this question what would you uh dr chapman i'll start with you again what would you suggest to anyone who's feeling overwhelmed frustrated um experiencing anxiety or anger right about now? Well, I work with a, a lady this week like that. She's got a new baby. She's uh, still expected to work from home right now. She also has a husband who's struggling, you know, worried about his job. 
Uh, she's got elderly parents who don't live close enough who she's concerned about. Uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I said to her, what we have to do is try to control what we can control, which are usually the smaller things. So I said to her, uh, do you have any opportunity in your house to uh, exercise? And she said, no, but I can take the baby out for a walk in the neighborhood. I said, well, that's exercise. Walking is, is good. And that gets you out of the house for a little bit. Even if it's only 15 minutes, that's better than nothing. And then we talked about uh, what she could do to regulate when she does work. Uh, because, you know, before she worked from 9.30 to 5, and now the work comes in all different hours of the day. So I said, why don't you try to set up a routine so that you work from, let's say, 9.30 to 12, then you take a break. That might be when you fix yourself something nice and you take, and take that break and take that walk with the baby. Then you come back and maybe do a little bit more work. Then maybe you and your husband can be in the kitchen and start a meal and have a conversation. Uh, then you might get on your computer and, and connect with a relative or your parents uh, or uh, do a board game with uh, some other couples that you know. Uh, I, I sort of gave her kind of a recipe like that. And she said she hadn't thought about it. And I said, you want to regulate it. You probably want to do this every day, almost at the same time. Because one of the things that's bothering people is they feel their life is out of sorts right now because there's no routine. Right. There's no predictability. Um, things seem to be falling in their lap, you know, without any kind of idea of uh, how to address it. And if you can regiment your life a little bit, that helps a lot. So we talked about that. And then she also mentioned, which I thought was good, she said, and we're eating healthy. We're trying not to eat junk food. I suggested to another person that they watch their caffeine intake, their sugar intake, their alcohol intake, and certain teas have a lot of alcohol in it too. So, I mean, not alcohol, I meant to say caffeine in it as well. Yeah. So these are the things you have to pay attention to because those things contribute to your anxiety level. Right. Dr. Ken, you want to add to that? Yeah. I, first of all, I would like to say, if you're feeling a certain emotion, whether that's anxiety or frustration or anger, that's normal. These are stressful. Absolutely. They're normal. <laughs> So when people say, and sometimes people have difficulty with negative emotions, but if you're feeling that's normal, this is a challenging experience. So I try to help persons to understand it's normal. Name it. How do you feel? Name it. And so sometimes when you name that emotion, it kind of helps you to grab a hold of it so you're able to manage. And it may not be that you're so much overwhelmed with the emotion, with the emotion. It's just that it may be because you're holding it inside and you're sure. not you're not to grab that emotion and then name it and 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 help them to understand that it's normalized then i say then help them to further understand what they can do about those emotions there's right. something you really can do you can name it you you can name it you can uh talk it over with a friend and you can and you can limit your you look at what is it when do i actually feel these emotions do I feel it in the morning? Do I feel it in the afternoon? And more than likely, more than likely, like a lot of us, you're, you're feeling it when you're watching the news reports or you're reading papers or you're talking or you're engaging in long conversations on issues. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed with these emotions, I suggest you limit your time. Maybe, you know, and this might be hard for you, but maybe it's just one time a day that you listen to the news. Maybe right. not any conversation you're having with family and friends is about this topic. So begin to limit it and, be, and allow yourself to begin to think about some other things. You've got other things in your life, right? You've got, you got other things that are going on. There's, there's I don't know, there's, there's exercising that you could do. There's, there are family, there are shows. There, more personally, I like to deal with there, There's reading. There's reading. <laughs> reading. You have your mind to focus on other things besides the, you're overwhelmed, not the emotion because of what's going on, because you allow yourself to be consumed with what's going on. So begin to, to limit the interactions that you have with news reports and conversations on this issue. Great. Um, now, uh, I'm glad, Dr. Chapman, you took us in the house because <laughs> that kind of 
brings us to the next question. Um, people are, are homebound that perhaps have never been like this before. Um, right. People have gone about their routines and they haven't been stuck in the house with the spouse and the kids right. and, and can't leave. So right. they almost feel imprisoned. They well, feel entrapped. Yes, yes. Um, so I, I guess this would lead to uh, disagreements and arguments uh, that may not normally take place. Or <laughs> there may be normal arguments that are amplified at this particular right. time. So right. while we're in this period, of quarantine, what 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 would you uh, suggest to help us to avoid uh, a bunch of arguments? Well, I certainly believe the first thing is to try to calm down. Uh, you know, I think people are more. Uh, intense right now than they realize. And so it doesn't take very much at all to make someone uh, feel irritated and, and short and maybe say the wrong thing. So I think you do have to pay attention to your own mindset and your body, you know, just to, are you tight? Are you in, you know, are you, uh, do you feel like, you know, you're about to just explode or whatever? Pay attention to that. I think uh, if somebody's irritating you, I think you, you, you can say to that person, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not in a space right now where I can even listen to this. Can, can we discuss this later? Can we discuss this later on in the evening after I've had a chance to maybe, I don't know, just take a walk or something? So you try to negotiate it if you can. Right. Um, so calming down, letting the other person know what's going on with you, the space that you're, the mental space that you're in is important. Uh, paying attention to your body language is always important. <clears throat> and you, and, and using the I language, not the you language, because you suggest an accusation okay. when you start out that way. Right. And I is, I'm owning my experience and what I'm going through and I want, that I want you to try to understand and join me in it. Yeah. So that all of that is important. Then you begin to tell the person what you need and don't complain, don't criticize, say what you need. Yeah. That's, that's very important. I need, I need uh, the house to be uh, less thrown together and things all over the place. I need people to pick up their clothes. I need people to wash their dishes and put them, in the dishwasher, whatever that need is, it's important to express that rather than turning it in and sulking. And then at some point it does become an explosive situation. Um, and I think, I believe in timeout. I advocate that a lot uh, to couples. If, you, if one person feels like they're getting hot under the collar, it's okay to say, you know, I think I need a break. I think I need to go downstairs. Maybe I need to get a glass of water. Maybe I need to, again, go sit out on the deck and, and cool off for a minute, but I'll be back in an hour. It's always important to say when you're going to come back. Don't just walk away right. because that will incite the other person also. Right. Um, and then um, I think then you try to sit down when you come back and hear the other person out. Just because you listen to another person and you don't agree with them doesn't mean that uh, they're right and you're wrong. When you listen to somebody, you're validating what they're saying. And validation is very important in reducing conflict. Yes. So you validate by listening and you validate by repeating back what the person has said to you. So that person hears, oh, she got it, he got it. Uh, and then you can both go into talking about how you want to resolve the problem. Great. Uh, you like to piggyback on that, Dr. Ken? Yeah, I agree with all those things. In addition, <laughs> To say that I like to tell people to set some boundaries because now we're in the house They're together we're stuck there's some things that we would do now we, we can't do anymore some things that we but we didn't do that we cannot that we need to do now so I believe in having open conversations 
and setting boundaries. We're talking about prevention now, because you are, if you're stuck with somebody, even yourself, even you're stuck with yourself, you might get annoyed with yourself. So you want to set some boundaries and plan ahead. Like uh, plan, this is, I went through this yesterday with a couple, because uh, they, were, they were coming at one another. So let's schedule when your timeout's going to be. Just don't, don't wait until you start getting red in the face. Let's, so uh, what do you need? The wife said, I need one hour. So what time? Because I'm very, I like to be very clear. She says, well, if you can nine to 10 every night, then I'll give me a chance to unwind and I'll be a little bit more available. And mm -hmm. so you want to do some prevention. Make sure you take some time out for you because you got your family stress, you got the side stress, but you also have, you need some time. And what, did, what you do, I don't know, she, she said, I just want to curl my hair for an hour or do my makeup or whatever, but she has, she'll have an hour and guess what? He's going to have his hour as well. Mm -hmm. And then I told him that you, you want to set some time aside. I tell this to everybody for couple bonding. Greetings, everyone, and welcome once again to this very special edition of Thursday Night Teaching, where we're trying to help you to remain emotionally and mentally healthy during this uh, season of crisis. And again tonight, for part two, I'm glad to have uh, Dr. Kenneth Ballard and Dr. Audrey Chapman. And so we're going to get right into it tonight. And I want to begin, and I'll start with you, uh, Dr. Ballas, since I started with Dr. Chapman last week. Um, how can parents help their children cope with all of the challenges that they are experiencing with this coronavirus? One of the best ways to help children is to normalize things because right now everything seems abnormal everything is out of whack you know they're, they're unable to go to school they're, they're doing their schoolwork at home uh to normalize things uh get them up at the same time every day have, eat at the same time help them with their homework let them go to sleep at the same time normalize their routine because once the, the routine goes out of whack then they're going to start feeling even the stress of what's going on even more so and then have open conversation with them about what's going on. But remember, keep it age related. If they're four years old, talk like it's a four year old. If they're 10 years old, talk like it's a 10 year old. Keep it age appropriate so that you're speaking their language so they don't need to understand, know everything depending on their particular age. So, and then ask them, how are you feeling about what's going on? Just don't assume, because I heard one parent say, oh, my children, they really understand everything that's going on. And I'm like, no, they're a child. Right, they don't understand. Right. They're just giving you lip service. So I have an open dialogue. How are you feeling about what's going on with the coronavirus? Tell mommy, tell daddy. I want to know. Okay, Dr. Chapman? Yes. Uh, what, what would you suggest to parents? Well, I, uh, pretty much on the same note. Um, I think kids need routine and they need consistent routine. That's why schools do everything at the same time. You arrive at 8.30, uh, you get your seat, you start uh, reading or you maybe do uh, present your homework and you have a routine and then there's uh, lunch at the same time every day and then there's recess at the same time. There's a reason that it's all routinized because children do better when they know what they can count on and it's certain. And um, so I would say, I agree with uh, Dr. Ballard, I think that you keep the same routine as much as you can. And it's also, I think, important for, for children to have exercise. So uh, at least in my neighborhood, I've noticed the kids are out on their bikes and they're taking walks. And uh, one of the parents set up a basketball uh, kind of portable thing on the sidewalk and the kids are able to come and shoot uh, hoops. So all of that's important for kids because they need to be moving around and exercising. And also when you exercise, you, you reduce the um, uh, depression because it, it uh, gets all the chemicals going in the, uh, the brain that, uh, that 
allows us to be a little bit more relaxed. So exercise is very important during this time. And I, I want to add on, maybe engage in some interactive activities, some games, okay. fun, things that are not very serious. So not board, only board games, the board games right. interactive things where they're interacting with you and you're laughing and you're, you're bringing a sense of togetherness and harmony. Okay, <clears throat> let me ask a question, just kind of piggyback on that. Uh, what about uh, children who are stir crazy right about now? Uh, being confined to the house and maybe they do get out for a couple of hours but then they're right back and so they their uh, imprisonment a uh, seeming imprisonment is normalized so how does a parent uh, right. deal with that and help their child uh, not to feel so uh, in prison dr. Chapman won't you yeah I have I have a niece that's going through that right now. She's an only child. So it's not just that children are going crazy. The households that have only one child in it mm -hmm. is really going through changes because and only children tend to have their friends become their siblings, but right. they can't get to their friends. Right. So those children are having an even harder time. So my niece is an only child and she's really, today she called and said, uh, can I just go to the store with the person that was going to, to the store? She just, I knew what she wanted. She wanted to get out. And she said, I'll stay in the car. I don't need to get out of the car. I just need to get out of my room. So I told her if she put a mask on and, a, and, her, and gloves and stayed in the car, she could go on the ride, but she couldn't go into the grocery store. Okay. So that was kind of how we settled it. But I think you have to kind of be creative and look at how you can, make it work where it's safe for the child and also uh you know good for the parent because the parent needed to get some food they were out of food uh, so that's one suggestion the other is uh, it i think you board games are important playing games being creative i noticed that uh one of the children in the neighborhood was that somebody gave her kind of a chart and she was copying it on the sidewalk with chalk and so that was an activity. Right. So you, you just, I mean, kids don't do stuff like that anymore, but they're having right. to resort to the old fashioned ways of playing uh, because they can't, uh, you know, they can't go online and they can't do stuff that um, they normally would do. Now, some parents are setting up chats for kids where they can talk to their friends. And that's another thing kids can do. Uh, but you know, children really like personal, very intimate experiences. They like to be in each other's faces. And right. that's what's difficult about this right now. Right, okay, <clears throat> Dr. Ken? I like what one parent did, because he has three children. <clears throat> they were going through the same thing. They were just frustrated and angry and all over the place. So I asked him, what are you gonna do? And he says, well, I'm gonna pick them, I'm gonna pick them up and we're gonna go out for a long ride. Mm -hmm. And then we'll stop at different places. I'll let them get out. You know, we'll go get some takeout, but the ride, I just want them to see the atmosphere. So if they're feeling pooped, they'll take them for a ride, a long ride, and make it interactive. Just don't have them in the back seat and you're talking about make it interactive and, and, and have a couple of stops at a safe where they can get out and feel some and, and breathe some of the fresh air. Okay, great. Well, <clears throat> since we're still in the house, uh, let's uh, talk about those individuals who have spouses that are considered to be essential uh, workers. Uh, how do you suggest, and I'll start with you, Dr. Ken, how do you suggest that both spouses deal with that? Because it's a challenge for both of them. Uh, the spouse who is the essential worker has the concern of bringing the virus home. They never know who they're coming in contact with. And then the spouse at home is probably concerned. Uh, so the, let, lest I do a whole lot of talking, uh, what, what would you suggest? Simply open conversation. Because it's stressful for both parties. We have to have open conversations, the do and the don'ts. And when emotions come up, have open conversations. I'm feeling frustrated about having to go in the other room. I'm feeling frustrated that I can't touch my children tonight, that I can't even touch you. 
Um, I'm, I'm stressed and I can't touch you. You go to work all day and when you come home, I can't talk to you. I can't, I can't hold you like I used to because I'm concerned because I want to make sure I'm going to keep everything. Have open conversation, talk about the, the boundaries and talk about your emotions. Okay, Dr. Chapman, what would you suggest? Well, I think, uh, you know, usually we're in households where, where one person is an essential worker, they generally work swings, shifts. They're not, you know, they don't have a nine to five. I have uh, several clients like that, actually. And so you, the two parents need to talk and figure out a plan on who's going to do what, you know, who's going to grocery shop, who's going to cook, who's going to wash clothes, who's going to help the kids with their schoolwork, because a lot of children are still doing schoolwork at home. And then also be understanding and create space and maybe be supportive and soothing of that person that is working that difficult shift. Because when they come home, they probably need to be alone. And I think they're suggesting with people who like work in hospitals and things like that, that they quarantine when they come home, That's that right. they don't you know, get in, in, engaged in a physical way with anybody in the, in the household. So that's hard. Right. But I think that, that people are doing that. You know, they're isolating themselves or they're going to the basement and sleeping down there until they have to go back into their shift, that kind of thing. So it's, it's, it, it takes coordination, it takes communication, yes. and it takes negotiation. Okay. Um, we know at this point, a lot of people are feeling isolated as a result of us uh, being ordered to stay at home. For those persons who are feeling isolated, what would you uh, suggest? Those people who are feeling isolated from their family, friends, from the whole world, what would you suggest um, to them? I'll start with you, Dr. Ken. Many, oh, many of my- Go ahead, Dr. Chapman, jump right in. Go ahead. Uh, I met, well, I've been doing um, a video conferencing all week, and many of my single clients are having a very hard time right. because they live alone, <laughs> and they depend on their so, their friends and their social life. Uh, that's kind of their their um, surrogate family, right? Uh, and so they depend on all the social activities, both going to dinner, going to movies. Going, going to activities at church, and some of them belong to civic organizations. That, that's what makes their world go around. And now all of that's been reduced. So a lot of them are doing uh, video chat. Uh, they are having, um, I know somebody that started, um, she started uh, a book club on, online. Uh, mm -hmm. She decided to do it that way with the video. Um, she, they, there are some folks that just get together at six o'clock every evening. They have what they call a happy hour. You don't necessarily have to drink liquor. They come together with tea and, and, and orange juice and things like that, but they're talking to each other. They're connecting, right. letting each other know what's going on. So that helps that person not to feel uh, so isolated. I had one, one lady who said that she allowed the grandparents were begging. They wanted to see the new baby. And of course, they didn't want them to come in the house. So they allowed the grandparents to drive up to the street and they held the baby up at the door. <laughs> and they were able to talk for a few minutes with this baby that's, I don't know, he's maybe like seven months old or whatever. Uh, and that satisfied the grandparents for a, for a little bit. Right. So you have to, again, being creative right now is is what matters <clears throat> and working with your depression and your anxiety and your frustration is crucial because those emotions tend to get in the way of you being being energized and being creative right. okay dr ballard i i say tell people what you need this is what i did i said to my family i need to see you well, I don't like to do video. I don't care. I need to see you when I'm talking with you. I need that. I want to feel I'm out here by myself. So now I have the whole family doing videos with me. Go on, help me because they want to stay on too long. So it's getting to the point. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I like it when I'm by myself late at night. I've even I talk to people in other countries. So uh, I'm, I'm doing a whole lot of video chatting. So I don't really, so it, it, and sometimes it feels like they're just in the same room. The other thing, and I know I said this in part one, and when you're talking with the, these persons, don't talk about just the, the virus. Talk about your dreams. Talk about positive stuff. Talk about memories of what or things that you're going through together. All that stuff kind of bridge builds a sense of community, and it can lessen you being isolated and alone. Okay, great. Well, we know as informative as these sessions have been, and they really have. Um, I almost hate to see them come to an end, and we may have to do something in another couple of weeks. Um, but what I'd like to uh, have the two of you do, because some people might need to do some follow-up. Um, this, this, this may not have done it for them. They may need to reach out and connect so as to help them to move through this season in a healthy way. So um, I'd like for you to share how people can contact you uh, <clears throat> telephonically or electronically or through social media, however, whatever you want to share so that they'll know how to reach you um, after uh, this uh, recording is in there. So uh, Dr. Chapman, how can we reach you? They can reach me by going on my website. There is a system on it where they put in the information of why they are uh, on the website and um, they can touch a button that says counseling or referral or, what, or, or just whatever it is that they are calling about and it will be sent to me. Uh, they can also call the office 202 756 50 42. And all of my uh, phone calls at the office immediately show up um, on my cell phone. And, um, and then they can call and they can text if they want to, which is 703-927-3071. So those are all the ways that they can be in touch with me. And I do respond, usually within about a day or two, I respond to people. They don't have a long wait. Okay, um, can you give us that, uh, uh, your website? AudreyChapman.com. Okay. AudreyChapman.com. That's, that's easy enough. That's easy enough. <laughs> yes, indeed. And if you right. don't mind, just give us those numbers once again, the office number. The office number is 202-756-5042. And if they want to text, that's 703-927-5071. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. All right, Thank Dr. Ken, how? Mine's, yes, mine's just simple. Text me, okay. 703-928-5493. 703-928-5493. All right, well... I want to thank both of you for your contributions, uh, your invaluable contributions uh, to these uh, two weeks of sharing. And uh, I want to encourage you to uh, remain strong and to take care of yourself um, and to check your relationship with yourself. <laughs> in, in the words of Dr. Audrey Chapman, um, during this season and we appreciate everything that you're doing to help those who have need uh in this season because we want everybody to come out of this emotionally and mentally healthy and so Absolutely. thank you again for joining me i appreciate it god bless thank you for both having of you. me thank, thank you, you for having me my pleasure brothers and sisters thank you again for joining us and uh, join us next Thursday for more TNT. It's gonna be exciting. Um, I don't know if it's gonna be exciting as exciting as I've been over the last two weeks, but it's certainly gonna be exciting 
and we want you to join us. God bless you and thank you. Join us for next week's TNT, Finding Unexpected Strength When Disappointment Leaves You Shattered. From the New York Times bestseller, It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. With your host, Dr. Leonard N. Smith. Well, I pray that you were blessed by what you heard today. And because you've heard what you heard, if you haven't made a decision for Jesus Christ, then now is the perfect opportunity. I know this is not, you know, church as usual, but salvation is business unusual. And so here's an opportunity now for you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. See, all humankind have a need for salvation. It didn't just begin. It began a very long time ago. As a result of man's sin, and sin is a problem, you know, it created an impassable gulf between us and God. Well, the wages of sin is death. And all of us spend most of our lives trying to avoid death. Think about it. All those medicines you take, you're trying to prolong the inevitable. You think about all of the exercise and eating right and all of that that we do. We're trying to avoid death. Well, the penalty for sin is death. God gave us a way back to him in Jesus Christ. He's the only remedy for our sin. And as a result of that, God receives us into his family, into his kingdom, if we would receive the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you're not saved, what I'd like for you to do now is take a moment and just pray with me. Bow your heads if you don't mind. And this is a prayer I want you to pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you admitting that I am a sinner. Right now, I choose to turn away from sin and I ask you to cleanse me by your blood of all unrighteousness. I believe that you are the Son of God. You are Jesus. You died on the cross to take away my sins. I also believe that you rose again from the dead so that I could be justified and made righteous through faith in him. I call upon the name of Jesus Christ to be the Savior and Lord of my life. I declare right now that I am a born again child of God. I am free from sin and full of the righteousness of God. I am saved in Jesus' name. I choose to follow you and I ask that you fill me with the power of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Listen, you're saved now, and we want to hear from you. All you got to do is give us a call, 703-979-7419. And we'll connect you with someone so that you can carry this experience to the next step. That's right. Just give us a call. 703-979-7411. Well, maybe you're not in the category of a person who's unsaved. Maybe you are saved, but you don't have a church. We invite you 
to make Mount Zion your church as well. Call that same number, 703-979-7411, and we'll receive you as a part of our fellowship in Jesus' name. God bless you. It's offering time now. And at the Mount Zion Baptist Church, if there's any time we get excited, it's at offering time. Well, we know that due to our inability to gather, we can't do offering the traditional way. But we invite you to take advantage of the opportunity to give through our text to give, through our Easy Tithe app, or you can do it uh, via the donation button you see there at the top of your screen. And finally, you can mail it to us. Listen, we'll receive it however you're willing to be a blessing to this ministry. If you are interested in the text to give, here's the number I want you to call, 703-372-9244. Text to this number again, 703-372-9244. That's the text to give. Otherwise, you can download the Easy Tithe app to your phone and give via that app. You can do it uh, via the donation button you see there at the top of your screen. And finally, once again, you can mail it to us. Any way you bless us, we'll be satisfied. Thank you so much for your willingness to give. Remember, although we're not able to meet traditionally, the need for your gifts remain. The ministry continues, even though we're unable to meet. God bless you. And thank you so much for your support. 